Right, or rather to bring things down to earth from Strasbourg to the um, Employment <coughs> Tribunal uh, and the rather disappointing comments of Lord Justice Mummery saying that, well, really, human rights doesn't add anything very much uh, to uh, the numerous detailed and valuable employment rights conferred on workers. So this could be a very short talk um, if he's right uh, in total. And, of course, he is right in part because um, there's nothing more irritating to a court or an employment tribunal than trying to crowbar in a human rights argument where there isn't one. But human rights points arising as they do in a minority of cases, but an important minority of cases, are very significant in those which they do. And John's absolutely right to say um, you can't be an employment lawyer or any other kind of lawyer um, without uh, knowing your way around the convention. So what uh, we're going to try and do this evening is something of a whistle-stop tour around some of the um, significant uh, ways in which the Convention affects employment litigation uh, in the UK. Um, we can't do all of them because there's uh, uh, an awful lot of it. Uh, I'm going to talk about just a couple of uh, parts. First of all, some of the general ideas about how the Human Rights uh, Convention operates, in particular in the Employment Tribunal. Um, I'm also going to say uh, a little uh, uh, bit about uh, national security. Uh, and how cases which uh, involve national security are dealt with. Um, and I'm then going to hand over to Nikki. I may come back with a few words on Article 10 if we have time, but we'll see how the, the timetable goes. So to start with, um, a little bit of um, revision, um, which never does any harm. The Convention, of course, is incorporated into domestic law by the Human Rights Act, and it's given effect in two ways. Firstly, the obligation under Section 6 to act in a way uh, that is compatible with human rights. That is an obligation which binds, of course, um, public authorities and public authorities only. And individuals can bring claims um, against public authorities under Section 6. But uh, while there's no right to bring a claim against a private individual or organisation, you will, uh, of course, be aware that Section 3 requires that legislation is, so far as possible, interpreted uh, compatibly, and read and given effect in a way that's compatible with Convention rights. And the distinction between the operation of Section 6 and the operation of Section 3 is one which has given rise to an enormous amount of academic and judicial consideration as to whether there is a horizontal effect of the Convention or even an indirect horizontal effect but you'll be relieved to know that I'm not going to go into the academic discourse this evening. I'm going to try and focus on more practical things. Um, if you uh, want to know the answers to those difficult questions, I suspect you speak to. I suggest you speak to John afterwards, because um, I'm not sure I understand them. Um, let's have a think about the basics instead. Um, the relevant articles, or the, the articles which are most likely to be relevant: right to a fair trial, right to respect for private and family life freedom of thought, conscience and religion, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly and association, and the prohibition of uh, discrimination. I think Nikki's going to talk in particular about Articles 6 and 8. Um, uh, I may talk about Article 10. Uh, Ben's going to talk about Article 11. And Article 9, we couldn't fit in. It's, um, uh, I suspect, enough there for another seminar, which we'll perhaps put on next year's uh, programme. Article 14, as you all know, is a little different from the other rights. It provides that the enjoyment of the rights and freedoms in the Convention shall be secured without discrimination. Um, and as you will be aware, that means there is no freestanding protection against discrimination, but only where one of the articles is engaged. So not necessarily that there's been a breach of another article, but that we are within the subject matter or the ambit of that article. Um, Article 14 gives us all sorts of different grounds, which are not the same, of course, as the protected characteristics under the Equality Act. They are broader. We've got all sorts of uh, slightly different uh, uh, things in there, including, uh, for example, uh, uh, property, birth and other status, other status covering all sorts of things, but not, not absolutely everything. It has to relate to uh, a personal characteristic 
so a characteristic of the individual rather than their um, uh, circumstances as applied to them. An easy example illustration of that is the case of Clift, which is mentioned there, which was a case about whether being sentenced to a sentence of life imprisonment as opposed to having a determinate sentence uh, was a personal characteristic which could amount to other status. And the court said it wasn't. So it has to be something about you rather than the way that you're treated. So how does that work in the employment tribunal? It's well established, of course, that uh, the ET may have to take uh, human rights points. That's been clear since uh, Lord Justice Mummery gave uh, guidance in uh, X and Y as to how to deal with human rights points in, in particular, dismissal claims. Uh, and we've got a, a, a stru now there we go, a structure which we've been offered um, by the courts as to how to think about it. And it's a really useful framework if you have a case where you think there might be a human rights point here, um, should, I, um, uh, should I run with it? So there's a series of questions to be asked. Do the circumstances of the dismissal fall within the ambit of one or more of the articles of the Convention? So, for example, is, there a, is the, the reason for the dismissal something to do with the personal life of the individual? Might there be an Article 8 point? Is it to do with freedom of expression, which you might get in a, a whistleblowing case? If they do, does the state have a positive obligation to secure enjoyment of the relevant right? If it doesn't, it's unlikely to affect the outcome. But if it does, then one has to go on to think about justification. So uh, we know, for example, that rights of confidentiality might limit uh, rights of freedom of expression. Um, Oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. If not, was there a per permissible reason for the dismissal um, under the uh, Employment Rights Act, which does not involve unjustified interference? If not, dismissal will be unfair for the absence of a permissible reason to justify it. But if there was, is it fair, tested by the provisions of Section 98, giving effect to them under Section 3? This goes back to what I was saying at the outset, the obligation of compatible construction so as to be compatible with the Convention right. So a dismissal can be unfair simply because it's uh, a, a breach of the Human Rights Act if you read Section 98 uh, in the context of Section 3 of the Human Rights Act. Um, and I then move on to national security. I got this picture because this is what I tell my kids is what my, my day to day life is like. It's very exciting in the security and vetting appeal panel, uh, I can tell you. Um, but national security is one of the ways in which the uh, Human Rights Act has a, has a real and substantial impact on individual cases um, within uh, the tribunal. Um, rule 94 is uh, the current rule. It's referred to in a lot of the cases as the Rule 54 procedure, but the, the new rule is Rule 94. It provides that a tribunal can conduct all or part of the proceedings in private, so far so uh, relatively uncontroversial, can exclude a person from all or part of the proceedings, that includes the claimant, uh, and or take steps to conceal the identity of a witness in uh, the proceedings, which may mean that the claimant is not entitled to know who is uh, giving evidence against him. And the Supreme Court has uh, looked at this specifically in the employment tribunal context, and it has concluded that the closed material procedure is compatible with the right under EU law to an effective judicial remedy for discrimination and with the right to a fair trial under Article 6. And the case which looks at that is Tarek and the Home Office, which was a case about, and there are quite a few of these cases uh, knocking around, some of you may have come across them, um, an immigration officer employed by the Home Office whose security clearance is withdrawn on uh, grounds that he'd become a security risk after a member of his family had been arrested and charged with and later convicted of terrorist offences. Pause there to say there will be all sorts of cases where the claimant will know an awful lot less than that. There will be many cases where uh, a claimant will be told that he has become a security risk, but he's not allowed to know why. Or that because it's uh, to do with a member of his family, but he can't know the circumstances of that. Uh, Mr Tarek brought proceedings for race and religious discrimination. The Home Office got um, section, uh, Rule 94 uh, orders 
uh, for the whole of the proceedings to be in private and for the claimant and his representatives to be excluded from part of the proceedings. And what the Supreme Court says wa said was there needs to be a balancing exercise between, on the one hand, the public interest in uh, national security, uh, and on the other hand, the individual's rights under Article 6. I would add to that the public interest in uh, justice being done in public uh, uh, as well. Um, and what the court did was to look at the way in which closed material procedures have operated in all sorts of different contexts. So they looked at detention orders, control orders, security vetting um, and surveillance and concluded that a closed material procedure of this sort can be um, uh, appropriate in particular in circumstances where the judge or the tribunal has independence uh, and relying on the use of the uh, special advocate. Uh, and they identified the safeguards, firstly that the, the judicial officer is an impartial and independent of the executive. Decision is taken after hearing argument in open court from both sides Pause there to say, of course, it's argument on both sides as to whether or not it's right to uh, restrict part of the proceedings on national security grounds, but in circumstances where one of the parties doesn't know what the justification is for holding the trial in secret. So it's partial argument from both sides. Um, uh, the uh, third matter which they relied on was um, the presence of the special advocate, which, of course, makes me feel fantastically important, but um, it's rather different from the reality in circumstances where the special advocate can't actually talk to the client after, uh, after a certain point in time. The decision is kept under review as the case proceeded, and that is important for anybody involved in a Rule 94 procedure, which is to say that um, quite often a case develops and it becomes clear that matters which it, it was thought were going to be uh, giving rise to difficulties such that a witness might need to be heard and closed, don't in fact, because the subject matter and the focus of the trial is slightly different. And you'll all have come across trials where you think the big issue is issue A, and in fact you end up spending quite some time talking about issue B instead. And it may well be that one can say at that point, hang on, we don't need to have this witness enclosed uh, anymore. And that's uh, partly the role of the special advocate, but it's also the role of the uh, open representatives as well. Um, you will have gathered from some of the comments I've made as we go along that I have some scepticism as to um, how uh, effectively this can work. Scepticism born not only uh, out of issues of principle, but also out of um, personal uh, experience. In terms of the way that judges look at this, it seems to me that they are uh, briefed and trained to the effect that they need to take very seriously what they're told by the minister or uh, security services or whoever it may be, and rightly so. But it makes it very difficult for a judge who is uh, told uh, by the respondent, as it usually is, um, that there is a particular concern to say, well, I'm not satisfied uh, uh, of that particularly where the threshold is set so low. The question is whether it is expedient, and that, I'm sure, is a word which was chosen with care, not whether it's fair or necessary or right or proper, but whether it's expedient, whether it will be useful uh, in effect in the interests of uh, national security. And it's a procedure which plainly is uh, less than ideal. Um, how does it work in practice? Well, the starting point is that the rules provide that all hearings in the tribunal take place in public, subject to rules 50 and 94, which do provide for restrictions. Uh, and the leading case on when the restrictions should be put in place is uh, the judgment of Mr Justice Underhill, as he then was, sitting in the EAT in a case called AB. Um, and there's a, uh, there's a great long... Uh, screed of comment there, which I won't take you all through now, but it talks about striking a balance between, on the one hand, the seriousness of the prejudice to national security, on the, uh, and on the other hand, um, the degree of uh, uh, infringement of the principle of open justice involved, uh, on the other hand. And fairly sensibly, he says, that the more serious the infringement of the principle, 
the greater the prejudice or risk of prejudice to national security needed to justify it. So it's one thing to say there should be reporting restrictions on a case. It's another to say that a claimant should be excluded from the whole of it. Uh, and the, the, uh, the arguments of uh, 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 the state will need to be correspondingly stronger in those uh, circumstances. What uh, the judge says at the end of the judgment is that tribunals can and should not abdicate their responsibilities to make the necessary assessment whenever national security is invoked. Uh, but on the other hand, the courts have said repeatedly that it's very difficult for them to interfere with the judgment of a minister. So it's, it's a very difficult position that the judges find themselves in. The latest word on the topic, which I'll um, uh, end with so far as this part of the um, talk is concerned, is the d decision of the Court of Appeal in Guardian News and Media Limited and AB, which came out three or four weeks ago, uh, at least came out in part. We've been given summary judgments so far. We're told that we're going to get detailed judgments, um, although how much of that will be in open and, and how much not, uh, we don't yet know. It's a criminal case, of course, but... Um, we've seen already from some of the examples that I've given you that judges in uh, employment cases will read across, and that's certainly what happened in uh, Tarek, from uh, other jurisdictions or other parts of the jurisdiction to identify what the proper principles are. And the restrictions which were thought to be appropriate in this case can only um, strengthen the views uh, of tribunals that it is uh, acceptable to make fairly significant inroads into what... Uh, perhaps has been taken for granted until now. So, um, at first instance, Mr Justice Nicholl ruled the whole trial should be in secret. Um, uh, the Court of Appeal modified that somewhat, but only to a degree, so parts of the trial may be heard in public. Swearing in of the jury, the reading in of the charges, um, part of the judge's introductory remarks to the jury, uh, and at least a part of the prosecution's opening address, the verdicts and some of the sentencing remarks, which you may notice misses out all of the important bits. Um, what you don't have, um, just by way of example, are the prosecution case and the defence case, um, which, of course, are the, the, the key aspects in understanding whether the trial is conducted uh, fairly. There will be transcripts kept, um, there will be very limited access to them. There will be some accredited journalists. I, I'm not clear entirely what accredited means, who can be present, although naturally there will be restrictions on what they can report. What there won't be, and what does exist in some other jurisdictions I know, is, is anybody there by way of uh, an expert observer uh, to satisfy themselves or to satisfy the public that the operation of the trial is being conducted uh, uh, fairly. Um, and while uh, plainly the, the court rightly placed considerable uh, faith in the operation of an independent uh, judiciary, they again said, in the field of national security, a court will not likely depart from the assessment made by uh, a minister. So it's going to be difficult again for um, judges to, uh, uh, to go against what the minister may say. So the conclusion reached by the court that the rule of law is a priceless asset of our country and a foundation of our constitution and that one aspect of the rule of law, both a hallmark and a safeguard, is open justice is a comment which seems to me gives real cause for concern in the context of uh, this uh, judgment. It's a safeguard which is plainly weakened by the closed material procedure and uh, we will await with interest to see what the full judgments say. That is the point, I think, for me to hand over to Nikki.